Welcome to Plant Your Seed. I'm your host, Fred Ferris. On each episode, we share stories of how ordinary people have transformed their lives. Each story is compassionate, each story is authentic, and each story is a transformation. Here are the stories of the people who are changing our world by transitioning to a plant-based diet. Today on Plant Your Seed, joining us from the Garden State, lovely New Jersey, is Stephen Sigman. Stephen is a plant-based photographer and founder of the website Nut Free Vegan, a resource for plant-based eaters who need to steer clear of tree nuts. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for being here. It's so great to have you on the show. I really appreciate it. I've been looking forward to it. Now, it must be very challenging to be vegan and nut-free. I mean, vegan stuff enough, but vegan and nut-free must be difficult. What are some of the difficulties that you faced just being vegan and nut-free? Um, it, it's a little easier now than it used to be. But early on, when I went vegan, uh, first, there weren't a lot of the products that you can buy at the store. Um, I went vegan 10 years ago. And at that time, there were tofu dogs and maybe a few other things, but that's about it. Uh, and then the the nut-based cheeses and milks started getting more into the, the population. And uh, I had to steer clear of those. So I basically didn't have them. Um, but now it seems like those things are a little more prominent. So it's not quite as hard as it used to be. I still need to be mindful because a lot of plant-based products do still have nuts in them. But it's gotten a little easier with time. I think these days, as I've learned a little more about food allergies, uh, it's a lot harder for other people who have an allergy to something like legumes mm -hmm. to go vegan, <laughs> which blows my mind. I, I've actually been kind of challenged to think of some recipes for a few friends who have that allergy and it was challenging, but, uh, it worked out, um, which just shows me that there is a way regardless of what your limitations might be if you work at it. Right. Now you mentioned that you became vegan 10 years ago. Um, when and why did you become vegan? I became vegan specifically after reading Jonathan Safran Foer's book, Eating Animals. Prior to that, I was vegetarian um, for about seven years, but I didn't really have the information about what happened in the dairy industry. So I assumed, like a lot of people probably do, that if I wasn't eating meat, I wasn't hurting animals. Right. Uh, but, but that book really enlightened me. And I kind of knew I was on that path from a young age because I was very in tune with animals, even if I didn't make the connection between, you know, my pet and the cow at the farm down the road. Mm -hmm. So I always had sort of this connection to animals, but I, I didn't realize until I was probably a teenager that my choices could make a difference for them. And, and that's when I went vegetarian. Um, and then after seven years of that, I kind of caved in for whatever reason and, uh, eventually went back to, strict veganism. Um, so it, yeah, it's kind of been a journey, but it, it's one that I feel like I've been on whether I knew it or not for pretty much my whole life. All right. Now take us back to that moment. You're sitting there, you're reading this book and all of a sudden you read, you read a passage and you're like, what, how did that go through your brain? How did it happen? Well, I'd actually been reading things like the omnivores dilemma and the fast food nation. And, and it was kind of something that I was exploring prior to that book. So I, I knew there was something that needed to change and I was kind of educating myself. And I think it was very early on in the Foer book that I, I, I should say that I work, my day job is designing books mm -hmm. and that book is designed beautifully. And there's an instance pretty close to the beginning where the page is, it's, it's basically a, a squiggly line and it's meant to represent fishing line and I think there was a statistic in there about something how if we extended all of the fishing line in the ocean, the commercial fishing line, it could reach the moon or something. Wow. And that just shocked me. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's kind of when the switch started to flip. 
And then as I went on through the book and just learning more about dairy, especially, uh, I, I just knew that I, I needed to walk away from that, from contributing to that. Dairy is a, is always the one that everybody kind of gives up last, right? Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Well, I think there have been studies done about addictive qualities to it. Uh, I don't know if it's dopamine or there's something released in your brain when you have dairy that's equivalent to a high you would get from drugs to some degree. I, I could be totally off base on this, but I feel right. like I've read that. <laughs> no, I, I think I've heard that as well. And I think people just, it's, you know, the things that are dairy are like ice cream and cheese, cheese especially. I think that might be the one that releases the dopamine. But uh, yeah, I think it's it's so ubiquitous that people just don't want to leave it behind. And really these days, there's no reason not to. I mean, there are so many alternatives that I I can't see. If you have the information about what happens to those animals and you're supplied with all of the options out there, I don't see any reason anyone would consciously continue to have dairy. <laughs> we see that and we understand that and we get it as far as understanding what happens to the cows in the dairy industry. How do you think we can relate that to other people? Well, there's that saying, I, uh, if slaughterhouses had glass walls, everybody would be vegetarian. Right. Um, and I think that's kind of an interesting idea, not to actually do that, but I think the sentiment of that is just that if people knew. And so getting that information out there is important. But to me, it feels like putting that information out there negatively and with anger is kind of not the way to go about it. And it creates more resistance. So that's why I really support animal sanctuaries, because I think they're pretty much the most positive example of activism you can have. Uh, so I would encourage everybody to make a visit to one of those. There, there are so many that I think there probably will be one close to you if you're listening to this. Right. And just what they do uh, to rescue animals from that industry is, is just amazing. And then if you go there, you can see an example of these animals getting to live a full life versus thinking about them somewhere where you don't get to see them. I think there's a disconnect there. Right. That's kind of what that glass walls thing is about. And so I think it's important to just make that connection. And I don't know that showing, you know, a slaughter line with chickens on it is the way to do it. But I think if you can come at it with positivity like the sanctuaries do and, and just experience these animals and, and their personalities and just like the joy they feel, it, it, it goes a long way to change your mind. I don't think you can ever force anybody to change their mind on, on any issue, right? Right. Let's move on to those sanctuaries. I noticed that you were doing an every single street in Montclair running challenge. How'd that go? It went really well. Um, I'm a pretty avid runner. And during the beginning of the pandemic, we kind of didn't know what we were supposed to do and what we weren't supposed to do. So uh, my wife and I were both training for a marathon when everything started. And rather than get rid of or let that fitness go to waste, we decided to take on this project where we would just run every street in our town. And I think it came out to be about 150 miles with all of the backtracking on dead ends and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, every year I try to do a race and raise money for a specific animal sanctuary. And so I knew I wouldn't be racing in 2020. And I decided to raise money for Woodstock Sanctuary with that project. And it was really surprising because sometimes I struggle to get the money that I'm looking for. Right. But maybe it was the pandemic and people were more generous. I don't know. But I set a $500 goal and I blew past it really quickly. Um, or maybe it was the nature of the project. It wasn't just me training for a marathon or something. It was kind of quirky, creative right. thing where I was drawing maps every day and <laughs> <laughs> plotting routes and doing this weird, taking photos along the way of like 
weird things I see, but for for whatever reason, it really resonated, and uh, I was very excited to be able to raise even more than I hoped to for Woodstock. Well, that's great. That's a, a great thing that you did there. Thanks. Do you have any projects going on right now that are involving Farm Sanctuary? Right now, I'm uh, planning what we're going to do this year as in terms of raising money during a race. And my wife and I signed up for an Ironman, or a half Ironman, I should say, in September. So I think that's probably what I'll start raising money for in a few months. I don't really know what races are going to look like this year, if they're going to happen at all, but that's the plan for now. Um, Because I can't visit sanctuaries, I just try to support them as much as I can financially. Uh, And I did a lot of that during the pandemic. Um, And I also have really started, obviously not during the pandemic, but prior to that, visiting sanctuaries and putting my camera to use and photographing animals, uh, which I, I just find is a great way to sort of inform people as well. So I don't know if anything will come of that or not, maybe down the road, but uh, that's about the extent of what I'm doing with sanctuaries right now. That's really great of you to take your profession and kind of go and use it at a farm sanctuary to kind of get the message out. It's just such a great place to be and to photograph animals. It's just really fun. So that's, uh, it, it's just as uh, beneficial to me as it is to them. Right. Let's circle back to uh, Nut Free Vegan. Mm-hmm. How did that website come about? It came about because I wanted to do more to help animals. And I thought the biggest way that I was doing that myself was through what I ate. And I thought maybe if there are people who have allergies like I do, they would want to go vegan, but were probably put off by it because of all of the nut-based products. So I decided to start the site as a way to just kind of share what I'd learned in the years where I had gone vegan and tried to figure things out on my own to kind of give them a little bit of a head start. And so in 2017, I started it and uh, just it was a recipe a week. And that's still what's happening every week. I post a recipe and uh Uh, What I've learned really in the past year is I'd kind of focused on the veganism part more than the nut free. I mean, Mm. it was, I would make something nut free, but it it occurred to me that that wasn't enough. Like I needed to make things that weren't just a nut free option for somebody. I wanted to make things that are really exciting to people Mm. who have that allergy. And so I kind of got involved more with the food allergy community recently. And so I'm focusing now on things that aren't just substituting nuts here or there, but making really like whole foods, plant-based meals that uh, just are really for everybody, whether you have an allergy or not. And I I try to be mindful of of as many allergies as I can now because I, I learned that I was sort of leaving people out by focusing on nuts, even though that's the only allergy I have. And I figured if I can help more people to go vegan by providing recipes that they don't have to be afraid of, regardless of their allergy, then that in turn is going to help the animals. It's going to help the environment. It'll help their health. Uh, So it it just really came out of service uh, is the short answer. Right. No, that's, that's fantastic because you have all these people, right? And they're, they're sitting there and they're like, oh, I'd love to go vegan, but I, I don't even know where to start. So I'm not even going to do it. I'm just going to stick with what I'm doing. Yeah, I get emails uh, a couple times a week from people who say that they've been wanting to try veganism and they were afraid to do it. And so they found my website and have made a few things and it's kind of helped them along the way. So I just think that's, if I can be a gateway to veganism, uh, I feel like I'm doing my job. Now, Spoken.com named you one of the top rated vegan bloggers and featured some of your recipes. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I'm kind of new to them, but they're uh, an app 
uh, kind of a crowdsourced app and website for people with food allergies where you can rate restaurants and meals, uh, websites, various things uh, as far as allergies go. And it's, it's, it's crowdsourced where people will go to a restaurant and they'll mark it on there. This place has so-and-so or beware of this place. And uh, I think it's a really cool idea and it's really helpful. Um, but I, like I said, I'm pretty new to it, but I look forward to getting more involved with it this year. I just think they're doing a great service. When did you find out that you were allergic to nuts? It was really early on. Um, I was born with asthma mm -hmm. and a million allergies besides nuts. So I was in the hospital a few times just as a really little kid because of my allergies. So I knew pretty early on that I had to steer clear of them. And luckily, I, I haven't outgrown them, but my the severity of my reactions is a lot less than it used to be. Um, so I'm pretty grateful for that, especially when I see now how more and more people are having more severe reactions to things, um, which is why I try to be so mindful. But it's that comes from just having gone through it myself and, and knowing how terrible it is for such a long time that if I can help somebody else not go through that, then that's, that's awesome. Can you give us an example of some of the other allergies that you had? Sure. I'm allergic to, uh, animal dander, um, certain kinds of grass, certain kinds of trees, uh, well, there are nuts, um, a lot of things that I, I don't even remember anymore. But wow. when I was a kid, I would get, they would do these allergy tests where they just put a little bit of an allergen under your skin. And they, I mean, they would go all the way up both of my arms from my wrists to my shoulders. And I would just have all of these reactions to things. So, uh, there were quite a few, but, uh, as I've gotten older, they don't seem to be as severe. So I, I, I've almost forgotten what <laughs> some of them are because wow. I, I don't really have any reactions to them. In a way, you've kind of either outgrown them or you've outgrown them for what you're eating. It could be, yeah. Um, I, I can't say for sure, but uh, that's certainly possible. I, I don't know even if other people have had situations like that or not. That's probably something I should look into. Um, but for whatever reason, I've outgrown a lot of them and, and the food allergies seem to be the ones that linger, uh, except for animal dander. Um, I kind of outgrew that by taking in a rescue cat and yeah. just learning to live with it. And I adjusted to it. So uh, maybe if I do that with other things like ragweed, if I put a bunch of it in the apartment, I'll, <laughs> I'll grow just going to grow some more ragweed around here. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Dump some grass clippings in my house. <laughs> Lucky for Pinky the cat, right? Exactly. Oh, she would eat it all. So I wouldn't have a chance to adapt to it. <laughs> <laughs> now I recently heard about replacing cashews with sunflower seeds. Is that one of the substitutes that you use? It is. Um, I actually just did a ricotta cheese with sunflower seeds. <clears throat> uh, and I also use pumpkin seeds kind of interchangeably with that. But yeah, it, it gives you the texture. Um, they, they blend well. Does it give you the white cream color? I, yeah, I think it's more of a beige. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, so it, it, it does. And, and the other ingredients in whatever you're making will tailor the color to. Personally, I'm just thinking Alfredo. <laughs> right. As far as your um, current venture, which is nutfreevegan.net, what is one thing that's really exciting you in your business right now? I think just reaching out to and being embraced by the allergy community has been super rewarding. Uh, in the last year, because as I mentioned, that's kind of a population that I wasn't as focused on as much as the veganism and really leaning into that has been fulfilling because that's ultimately my audience. And the more people I can service in that field, I feel like the more successful I am. 
And uh, I, I think another thing is just finding my creativity more has been super rewarding and just leaning into it, um, which I hadn't really done in the first few years of it. That has really paid off for me just in my own fulfillment creatively. So I, I think it's, it's getting a lot of momentum now and hopefully a cookbook will be in the future. I don't know. I'm uh, nice. sort of, planning one myself i don't have a publisher or anything but that's something i think about so yeah it, it's just watching it grow and seeing it affect more people is is what i'm excited about because it it the more it does that again going back to animals like the more animals i'm helping which is kind of my primary mission right it must be very satisfying it is yeah it's great and oh and another thing is I've found that the photography is something that is is just so rewarding to me. And that's something that I really focused on as well. And and watching myself grow as a photographer has been great. And it's led to freelance work, um, which I would have never expected. So that's been really cool, too. Do you think that the pandemic kind of fueled this in you? I think so. Um that really fueled a lot of things in me. A lot, I know that it was a terrible year in a lot of ways, but I'm very introverted and being at home, and I'm also very self-motivating, so being at home and having all of this time to focus on things has been a godsend for me. I feel like not only with the Nut Free Vegan, but in a lot of ways, I've grown so much in 2020. And uh, is kind of a blessing. And I really am excited to bring that into the new year because I, I feel like there's sort of a, a supercharged engine now that, that I can uh, bring to everything. Right. I think that a lot of people, you either had to take 2020 as a blessing or a curse. And I think that a lot of people did take it the way that you took it. I took it as a way to kind of just kind of focus and recharge and figure out what's working and what's not working and move on from there. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, it really depends on your circumstances. I know a lot of people who have to go out on the front lines every day and, and can't avoid going out of the house and, right. and being exposed to something. So, uh, I feel very lucky. I'm able to work from home and, uh, I've been able to really, understand how to manage my time better and, and find a lot of hours in the day to focus on uh, sort of personal growth and, and growth with the Nut Free Vegan and some of my other endeavors. Uh, running in particular, I, I was running far more last year than I <laughs> ran in prior years, just because that was really the only <laughs> way I saw getting out of the house and, and letting off some steam. So, uh, it, but yeah, it's, it's, I, I felt very fortunate to be able to thrive in that situation when a lot of people couldn't. Right. When you changed over to being plant-based or vegan, was there anything that you struggled with? Uh, initially, I think just the, the nuts, um, cause there weren't a lot of products, but I think there was probably cashew Parmesan or a few things like that. Um, but I, when I went vegetarian, I did it very haphazardly and I did no research. I, I was a teenager, so mm -hmm. of course I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> but I, uh, I just kind of jumped, you know, feet first into it and pretty much struggled for seven years with the nutrition that I needed because I, I did nothing to prepare. And with veganism, I really made sure that I prepared myself uh, to start doing it and one thing that's helpful is to just find out what you can have instead of realizing what you can't have, because I think that mindset is uh, going to lend itself more to being successful. So that was very helpful. Um, but I didn't really, I don't think I really struggled too much with anything other than the nuts. Um, if I did, I think I had the mindset that, I was committed to this and 
the reason I was doing it was to help, you know, not kill animals, basically. And that superseded anything that that might have gotten in the way. So it, I don't even remember having too many hurdles. But if I did, uh, they weren't much of a hurdle at all because my my vision was so clear with it. When you went vegan, was it like one day, a week, two days, 10 years? How, how long did it take you? It was right away. Uh, so it was day. the next day after reading that book or like that moment that you read the book, you were like, that's it, I'm done. Yeah, as soon as I read it, uh, to my recollection, that's what happened. And uh, I did some research that day to see what I needed. Um, I had the internet, which was very helpful because... When I tried vegetarianism, it was in the 90s and the internet wasn't around yet. So I didn't have the the things at my fingertips to do the research I needed. But in uh, 2010, it was, it was a lot easier. So I prepared myself. And uh, like I said, it was just a, a f- switch that flipped. It, I mean, it was kind of building. But when I, when I read Foer's book, it just... I was like, I'm done. It was like putting my tools down and walking away. Uh, <laughs> it just, uh, it, that was it. That was the day. It was a drop the mic moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what is one habit that helps you stay on track with your plant-based diet? Hmm. Oddly enough, practicing gratitude, I think, is is a habit that helps to keep me on track. I do that every morning. I have a, a very rigid morning routine of which gratitude is a part. And I think that ultimately helps me to sort of con, uh, harvest my compassion for the day. And because I'm seeing what I have and what I'm grateful for, and then I can turn that around on, on uh, how I can project that outward. And uh, so I think gratitude is the biggest thing. For me, that leads to compassion and it, it helps to keep me on track. But I don't feel like I would ever slip with it if I weren't doing that. Uh, I mean, I'll never, I'll never eat animals again. But it is good to have that reminder, and and gratitude is a is a strong one for me. Right now, you you said you have a pretty rigid morning routine. Do you mind sharing that with us? Sure. It's uh, I wake up and I make coffee. Oftentimes, it's mushroom coffee to kind of get my brain working a little better and uh it's meditation and i read stoicism and i journal and i do a gratitude practice and then i do 20 push-ups <laughs> uh or i try to move in some way for a few minutes um but that's pretty much it yeah so you don't get up take a cold shower go for a run any of that no, I'm more of an evening runner. I, oh. There's something about doing it in the morning that I can't, I don't know, I, <laughs> I can't wrap my head around it. <laughs> can't get up Which and get Which is frustrating. Going. Yeah, I, all, most races are like at 7 a.m. So on the day, I really have to trick myself into doing it. But uh, yeah, the cold showers come in the evening too, after running. Really? I always, yeah. I always heard like cold shower in the morning, warm shower at night. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm sure it's different for everybody, but. Well, I think the cold shower makes sense in the morning um, if, to wake you up, but I don't, I don't really need to be woken up. I just, uh, I, I'm programmed to get up and do my routine. And I, I just, uh, studying stoicism has really helped me with getting up and, and just doing the things I need to do. But uh, yeah, the cold shower at night, it's only like 30 seconds. Let's do it for 30 <laughs> seconds at the end of a regular shower, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not in there for 10 minutes. <laughs> Take a 30 second cold shower at the end of the night. Yeah. <laughs> now, what, yeah. <laughs> what cookbook or book have you gifted the most to somebody transitioning to a plant-based diet? Ooh, um, I don't gift a lot of books, but I do send people to different websites that I, uh, that I really get a lot out of, especially for people who are nut free. Um, and those would be probably the full helping, uh, dot com, which is a fantastic site and very aware of nuts. You can search for, uh, nut free meals. Vegan Richa is another one 
who has nut free options and, and a searchable nut free uh, grouping. And uh, Vegan Yak Attack is uh, one of my favorites too. And I think the last one is uh, actually one that's kind of new to me, but it's Plant Based Jane, who uh, is also a nut free vegan blogger. So I was very excited to find her and I've shared her with a few people as well. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Finally, can you give me one word to describe how you felt before you became vegan and one word to describe how you feel now that you are vegan? Ooh, uh, unaware and illuminated. Illuminated. I like that. I like that a lot. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you. What is the best way for people to find you on social media, Instagram, the web, wherever they could find you? Sure. Well, first, thanks for having me. I, this was a lot of fun and I really love the show. Um, so I'm really honored to be on it. And people can find me at thenutfreevegan.net. And I'm at, at Nut Free Vegan on all social media platforms. So come find me. Nice. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Hope you are inspired by this story. And remember, it's never too late to plant your seed. Links to everything we talked about on the podcast can be found on Instagram at plant.yourseed in the show notes tab in the bio. If you enjoyed the show, remember to leave us a review. And until next time, thank you for listening.